Great. So I hope that you've had a nice break. Even while you've been continuously practicing, I'm sure. <laughs> and uh, not counting the moments when you're not practicing or when you're negligent, but just counting those moments that you are watering the flowers in your mind. That's the most important thing. My teacher, Arjun Brown, says every moment of kindfulness is like watering the Bodhi tree. So it's like there's this beautiful Bodhi tree taking root in your heart. And every time you give water and sunlight to that tree, it keeps on growing. Don't worry too much about the weeds around it, because the Bodhi tree by nature is so strong, so resilient. So this morning, we were talking a lot about the preparatory um, work for meditation that we can put into place in our everyday life through establishing beautiful motivations, through trying to align our actions of body and speech to those motivations, and um, also by learning how to use our senses in skillful ways, especially learning to look at things from different angles and understanding that there's not only one way to perceive a situation. Yeah, there's many different ways, and sometimes it's more skillful to just pick up the way that actually leads towards wholesome states of mind increasing, rather than to try to get to the heart of the matter and try to find some kind of objective or ultimate truth. Everybody thinks they're right. Everybody thinks they have the truth. You know, I do spend some time on social media, promoting my project and just keeping people in touch. And it's very common to see posts that people put up and they say, you know, this is not right, this is the truth. But what do you mean? Well, it's the truth. And you think, yes, but truth is so subjective, isn't it? It's so biased. And whose truth are we talking about? You know, what's true for one is, is different for another. And so I think, you know, rather than being obstinately attached to our version of events, sometimes we can have that flexibility of mind. It's another aspect of creating a soft mind. A soft mind is not only soft in the way it receives um, sense impressions, in the way it responds, but also in terms of its flexibility, its willingness to see things from other people's perspective and put ourselves in others' shoes. <laughs> So this morning we talked about uh, about that, giving you some tools, which to you know, with which to help you uh, approach your meditation. Another aspect is that I'd like to talk about um, starting off our practice with very clear intentions, and that's another aspect of sati of mindfulness. So that when we sit down to practice, we not only establish our mindfulness and try to infuse it with these beautiful motivations of kindness, gentleness, letting go, but also we're quite clear about our purpose in the meditation, what we're sitting down and trying to achieve, what kind of direction we want to be moving in. And the Buddha said that um, you can know it's the Dhamma, you can know it's the teachings of the Buddha, including the um, precepts of restraint for monks and nuns if it leads to peace if it leads to um, disenchantment and disengaging and really here we're talking about with negative states of mind and of course eventually really disengaging with this whole sense of identification with the world right so this understanding that none of this really belongs to me and what I'm actually taking as a sense of self or as me or mine is just nature doing its thing. Yeah, so our hand, our grasping becomes looser and looser and it becomes easier to just let life live through us without possessing, owning, identifying with whatever we experience. Yeah. So I was thinking, you know, there's another simile I wanted to share about the preparation because when I first um, went to my retreat in 1996, it was a Goenka retreat, as I've mentioned before, in a very beautiful part of India called um, uh, Dehradun. So it's in the foothills of the Himalaya in Uttarakhand now. It's known as Uttarakhand. At that time it was Uttar Pradesh. And uh, I wanted full immersion, you know, I wanted to go to a retreat where there was no escape from my mind. So when I was reading the rules of, you know, not even looking at other retreatants, never mind speaking, you know, putting away pen and paper, not writing anything. So not only keeping noble silence of speech, but even as far as possible of mind. Um, I was really keen because I just wanted to get to the root of like, 
how my mind causes suffering for itself and whether it can kind of dig its way out. <laughs> so I had no real preparation other than this urge to know what was going on. Um, and I think I was, you know, I was pretty okay in my conduct, but certainly not perfect in the five precepts by any account. You know, I was a 19 year old traveling around and open to all kinds of experiences. You know, I never got kind of hooked on any particular illegal substances, but I did, you know, do my little bit of experimentation <laughs> because I felt that I just wanted to know for myself, you know, and I'm certainly not encouraging that that's the way to go in any way, but I knew I was on a, a, some kind of search. So my um, journey led me to this retreat and I went in, followed the instructions, you know, sat there with eyes closed and opened my mind to this inner world. And it was as though I'd gone inside a cupboard, maybe a really tall cupboard with lots of different shelves. And I just opened the cupboard doors and everything just fell out. <laughs> all the old jumpers with dust, all the kind of boots and the Wellingtons that I'd left there like years before, or maybe the toys from my childhood or the CDs or the songs, it all just kind of came tumbling out in my mind, of course, this is a metaphor. And it was really quite bizarre. Sometimes I would think that I was hearing the bell ring and then I'd be like, was it the bell? Or, and I'd open my eyes and there'd be no bell. I'd be just hearing it in my mind. And uh, yeah, I even had a vision, which is a wholesome vision of um, being a nun in a row of nuns wearing the Burmese robes. That was quite surprising because I don't think that I'd seen a photo of that. Perhaps I had, but it was a very clear vision. And basically things were so vivid in my mind that it was almost difficult to differentiate between what I was just imagining and what was really going on. I wasn't, you know, starting to have hallucinations or any kind of schizophrenic experience at all. But it was just interesting because it felt as though everything that had gone into my mind through the course of my life was now just falling out in no apparent order <laughs> because there was no real preparation there. And I think, you know, it's a nice simile because when we start to learn to differentiate between wholesome and unwholesome states, it's as though we've started to know where to keep things on which shelf you know so on one shelf we have all our I don't know nice t-shirts folded up neatly in a pile you know that's the say the loving kindness shelf you can pick down some loving kindness when you need to and then another shelf or the bottom of the wardrobe might have your shoes your boots so the cupboard starts to be a little bit more orderly yeah and we can open that cupboard and first of all it doesn't just fall out on us but we can actually go to the place we want to go to find what we need. And it's similar with the mind. We start to develop some tools. So we look in our mind and we see, okay, so there's a little bit of tension here. There's a little bit of irritation with what, maybe some sense impressions that have gone before. Where's the shelf of loving kindness? Can I go there and just, you know, take out a little bit of meta for my mind as an antidote? Yeah, so we have these different tools. We also have maybe some reflections to help us gladden our mind. So what we did before in the practice um, was to kind of bring up a sense of virtue, anything that you can remember that you've done that's maybe benefited yourself or someone else, however small, um, or even just a quality that you see and recognize in yourself, or perhaps you just recognize the beginnings of that quality, but you can appreciate that it's something you value and want to develop further and we can bring this up and reflect and the Buddha called this um, sila nusati or chaga nusati reflecting on one's own virtue reflecting on one's own giving chaga is like generosity goodness and also of course buddha dhamma sangha we can reflect on the beautiful qualities of a buddha of someone who has purified their mind and awakened to the four noble truths to the point where there is no possibility anymore for him to develop or generate craving and aversion. You know, somebody who has so much wisdom and compassion that that just becomes an automatic response to whatever happens in life, to whoever's in front of them. They just respond wisely and in a compassionate way. And there are beings like this, you know, we can meet them even today. 
to a greater or lesser degree. I mean, we don't have to have enlightened teachers, otherwise most of us would be out of a job. <laughs> We'd never dare to even get going, you know, until probably most of us have already passed away. But we can see certain qualities in others that really just reflect our own potential back to us. And there are people I've met many in my life, not many, but a handful, let's say, who I have very deep confidence in as those who have seen deeply into the Dhamma. So they become what the Buddha described as a true Sangha, um, somebody worthy of offerings, worthy of respect, somebody on the straight path, the direct path, bound for Nibbana. And this can really gladden the heart when we're able to connect with those qualities in such beings and recognize that we wouldn't notice them in others if they weren't at least starting to flourish in ourselves. You know, by the very fact that you recognize and value these things, that is your wisdom so far, right? You know, this feels right. It's, you know, it has the taste of freedom. Um, you know, the effect of being around such people, how it makes you feel. You know, you feel you can relax in the presence of such people, even sometimes in the presence of an animal right, or a pet. This can also rouse feelings of loving kindness. So we have these various tools and, of course, also just this ability to incline our mind in certain ways. So we don't have to actually actively cultivate metta or compassion. We can just, if you like, put on the lens of loving kindness as though you're picking up a pair of sunglasses and they've got a particular tint and we can look through those eyes through those uh, lenses just with that little bit more warmth in the suttas there's a nice phrase um, related to three monks and that the way they were living together and looking after each other and it said they were viewing each other with kindly eyes and I think that's so beautiful you know just looking at the best in each other, looking at ourselves softly, at each other softly and gently, giving each other the benefit of the doubt. So can we look upon our own mind, our own inner world with those kindly eyes rather than fault finding eyes? Yeah, the kind of eyes that make the mind really hard, really uh, concrete mind, you know, nothing can really soak into that kind of mind. It just rejects things so easily. It rejects others so easily. So our cupboard becomes orderly. And to take that simile a little bit further, you can almost imagine that as we progress on the path and those wholesome qualities increase, everything that's just junk, you know, is removed from that cupboard. So there's less and less actually in there to the point where one day the shelves start to disappear. You open that cupboard and even the shelves have gone. There's nowhere to keep anything anymore. And of course, in that simile, the shelves are like the sense of self. You know? You could imagine them like the five candors. So we no longer identify with our body, with perception, thought, feeling, um, will, or consciousness. So that cupboard becomes completely empty. We look inside and there's just space. There's just emptiness. Nothing to cling to, nothing to keep. The Buddha actually said, Sabbe dhammam nalam abhinivesanaya. It means... Um, there's nothing worth clinging to. There's nothing worth keeping, which might sound in a way quite shocking, but in another way, it's also a huge relief because it doesn't mean that we reject life, we reject experience. It just means that we don't try to cling to it or own it. We don't try to possess it, you know, in ways that really burden the mind. We've, instead, we free our mind. We free this cupboard, the space, there's air that can pass through. Yeah. So this preparation creates a, um, a mind that is orderly and a mind that is ready to settle into sati, into establishing more mindfulness and also into the deep states of samadhi, the deep states of calm. So I wanted to talk about samasati a little bit more. And as promised in the blurb, because we have to write blurbs, <laughs> so I try and keep on my, on my theme. Um, I want to talk about it not only as awareness and attention, but also its function as gatekeeper. Because this is something that's often overlooked, I think, in, in definitions of right awareness. And so we can define awareness as that aspect of attention that brings the experience of the present moment into focus, into a kind of sharp relief. 
um, and also is able to sustain that focus on the experience for long enough to see more deeply into the nature of things. So, of course, if we really can sustain our awareness on, you know, the body, on the mind, after some time we start to see that it's changing all the time, that it's impermanent. Yeah, and not only that it does change, but that it is changing from moment to moment, almost like a many, many times in a second. <laughs> Some kinds of vipassana practice, you can get this kind of experience very clear. You can actually feel bodily sensations arising and passing so quickly, like the Buddha explained it as um, mustard seeds just popping in a pan. Sometimes I, I use mustard seeds, and the minute they get to a certain heat, they start. Choo -choo 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 -choo. And if you don't take them off the heat, or if you don't have the lid on, they just go everywhere. So you have to keep the lid on, take them off the heat, <laughs> and let it all settle down. And sometimes it feels like that in the body and mind. It's everything's just coming and going so quickly, you know, there is really nothing to hold on to. So this awareness helps us to see these things. And of course, if it's changing so fast, how can we really say, this is me? You know, if it was a self, the Buddha said, we'd be able to say, May it be this way, may it be that way. May it not lead to affliction or may it not disappear, right? Things we want to keep, we don't want them to vanish, but they vanish in their own time when those causes and conditions fade. The result of those causes and conditions, the effects also disappear, right? So we can't do that. And because of that, we can't really consider these things as a self. And there are certain functions of mindfulness as well. So this is, you know, the way we direct our mindfulness to those areas of body and mind. But it also has certain functions right from the beginning of the practice. And the first one is to actually prevent the setbacks to training, which in this case means, um, I didn't write down the, the quote, but I think it's in the Anguttara's, um, to prevent the setbacks in the training, which means lapses in your virtuous conduct. Yeah. So because you're mindful, it's less likely that you're going to break any precepts or that might cause yourself or other people harm. You can stop yourself before you move into that unwholesome speech or, or act. You know, you can re recollect that, oh, you know, I had this instinct to just like squish an ant or something. But because you're mindful, it's like you put the brakes on the mind. Yeah, you put the brakes on and you actually are able to stop yourself doing that wrong thing. And I think it's really helpful to reflect afterwards, oh, I was able to stop doing that. And how did that feel? Because a certain amount of confidence and strength comes from knowing that you can restrain. And then the second one is that it helps us restrain the five hindrances. And as I said earlier, these five hindrances, they're actually defined as um, obscurations of the mind that weaken wisdom. So it's as though you've got a curtain or a veil in front of your eyes. So in this case, it'd be like wearing a pair of spectacles that are really, really dark or really dirty. And you're trying to see something clearly through those. You're only going to see kind of blobs and, you know, blotchy sort of things, forms that are quite dim or that seem very far away, even though they're close. You know, A bit like when you go into a darkened room, you don't really see very much because the lights of the mind have not really turned on yet. So these five hindrances like obscure the mind. And it's really interesting. I had this experience in meditation. I mean, many times, but this time was particularly pronounced where one moment I was just peaceful, just kind of going on with the breath and then suddenly noticing, oh, there's a joy here. There's a really subtle kind of bliss. And then that bliss kind of came up as a really strong energetic force in the mind, like lots and lots of energy. And with this ability to just remove these hindrances quite suddenly, and it really felt as though curtains were being pulled back, pulled back, pulled back. And almost as though there was only a very thin veil really between you know, this kind of more occluded state of mind and something much brighter are much more energized and sometimes it's like that you know we just slightly shift the focus of our awareness and boom you know something shifts or maybe there's just a little bit of ill will in the way that you're observing the breath you know it's like you're okay breath but I'll be with you as long as you change you know <laughs> have you ever had that like this is okay I'm being patient I'm being patient it's like mm, 
I'm being patient, but mm, nothing's happening. More patient. Okay, more patient, more patient. But you're waiting for something to change, right? Because actually you don't really enjoy, you don't really value what you already have. So this is a subtle kind of aversion. It's like, in a way, an upakilesa, like one of the more refined uh, manifestations of ill will. And just by, you know, remembering things like um, contentment, uh, the loving kindness that really asks for nothing in return, you know, unconditionally giving yourself to the moment. Sometimes everything can just brighten up. You know, the mind becomes steady. It becomes really clear. And you can enter a deeper state of meditation, deeper, um, calmer, more peaceful state of mind. And then eventually with the, um, the mindfulness, we're actually able to abandon sensory desire and loss. So this is at the higher levels of training now. And it's only really fully overcome at the third stage of enlightenment. So don't worry if you still have some sensual desire. I can assure you that most people do. And uh, it's just a, a symbol of, you know, a symptom of where you're at in the path. It's not a personal fault. And then there's also this aspect of sati. The word sati actually is smriti in Sanskrit. Um, and smriti means memory. So the word sati is actually related to memory. And my first teacher, Goenkaji, used to say that can't be right because sati is always about being aware in the present moment. But on closer inspection, there has to be memory involved because we know we should be mindful, right? We know we need to be aware, but we keep forgetting <laughs> to be mindful. This is the problem. <laughs> if we could remember to be mindful, we'd be mindful all the time. Sometimes it only takes that awareness, whoops, I've slipped from my meditation object and bang, it's back again. So it's this awareness, this memory or recollection, if you like, of what we're supposed to be doing. Yeah? Remembering the instructions, remembering you know, why we're here, what we're supposed to be doing and the, and the purpose of that mindfulness to start to overcome these five hindrances in our practice and in everyday life to help us live a more virtuous life and to keep those unwholesome states either out of our mind completely or at least at bay so that we're not increasing them in our daily life. And then going to our cushion and opening this really messy cupboard that we then have to deal with on the, on the meditation seat. So that's one aspect of uh, mindfulness as memory. And there's also an aspect of mindfulness as the gatekeeper. And this is really interesting because that function of mindfulness is supposed to um, keep the unwholesome states away. So you could imagine them as like enemies that want to invade your fort. And there's a, a nice simile I'm going to read straight from the suttas about that. And to keep the friends in, to invite the friends in and to keep them there, keep them entertained, keep them happy inside your mind. Right. So this is one of the functions of mindfulness. It's not that mindfulness should be just aware of anything. Anger, 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 hatred, hatred, hatred. Thoughts of revenge, you know. Sure, you can you can be mindful of that when it arises. But sometimes, as I say, mindfulness alone is not enough. We need that loving kindness. We need to recognize, actually, these are unwholesome states that I've allowed in my mind. Now I need to be careful about abandoning these things. You know, these are not leading me in the right direction, in a direction of peace and harmony. So it includes a, a certain amount of wisdom, you know, and mindfulness, wisdom, they go together, sati sampajanya. And we learn to um, understand what are our enemies and what are our friends, because sometimes we mistake the two, actually. You know, we keep the wrong things out. We let the wrong things in thinking they're good for us, but actually they're not. So I wanted to read this sutta, or at least the part of it pertaining to mindfulness. Um, and it starts by talking about seven ways of protecting a fortress. So there are seven, and I'll go through the first few fairly quickly, just to list them for you. And then there are four kinds of food. And the four kinds of food are the four jhanas. So here we can see how the gradual training, the first seven, lead to those four jhanas. So it's called the simile of the fortress, and it's in this rather wonderful book called the Anguttara and Nikaya. For anyone who wants to look in such books or 
has already maybe an interest in the early Buddhist teachings. So it's Anguttara 7, number <clears throat> 67. So when it's Anguttara 7, it means there's going to be seven points. <clears throat> so, and it usually addresses the monks. So I'm going to change that. What should we change? Should we change that to nuns today? Sometimes I change it to community, but let's have some nuns in the picture. I feel lonely otherwise. <laughs> okay, bhikkhunis. When a king's frontier fortress is well provided with seven appurtenances of a fortress and readily gains without trouble or difficulty four kinds of food, it can be called a king's frontier fortress that cannot be assailed by external foes and enemies. And then it goes through these seven. So the first one is confidence, sadda. Okay. And this is beautiful because this is really the start of the path, having some confidence that these teachings actually work, at least enough confidence to take the first step, right? And it's really interesting. I got a message from somebody the other day who's um, actually telling me that she's perhaps not got very long to live and asking me for lots of advice. And uh, I responded to say, you know, that I will reply in some time. But even before that, even before I responded, they wrote me this message back and they said, I wanted to let you know I was feeling a lot of pain with my condition 10 minutes ago and also alone. But then I thought of you and I knew that if you'd have read my message, you'd be sending me loving kindness. And then a beautiful feeling arose. And at the time, you know, you can, if you're <clears throat> a little bit unwise, you can take these things personally and think, wow, that's amazing. Somebody wrote to me and, you know, they immediately felt better. I must have some special powers or something like that. But actually, you know, all she did was send me a message. But because of her confidence, she was confident that if I would have read that message, I'd be sending loving kindness. And that was what caused her to feel better. It was the confidence. It was the sadda, the faith. No, very beautiful. Then the second two are called Hiri Otapa, Hiri and Otapa, some of you might know. It's often translated as moral shame and moral dread. But before you write that down, <laughs> I'd like to retranslate it because I think shame is probably not the right um, rendering of that word. I would rather call it moral conscience because it implies a certain amount of... Um, I mean, shame is a very Western concept. And in some cultures like Tibet, they don't even have the words for shame and guilt and certainly not self-hate. You know, this is quite an alien thing. But the Dalai Lama was apparently really shocked when he was told that some people hate themselves. He's like, but why would you do that? Why would you hate yourself? It's like, it just seemed like so peculiar to him, <laughs> which is interesting. So I'd rather translate that as moral conscience. And then moral dread, I think of more as moral caution. So we're careful about our behavior, yeah? We are restrained, we don't act impulsively, yeah? Or heedlessly. And these two are known as the guardians of the world, which is very beautiful, the guardians of the world, because as long as we have this sense of moral conscience and caution, you know, it's unlikely that we'll stray too far out of line. You know, you can often think, I often wonder how people that are involved in, you know, terrible genocides or, you know, actually, um, say in Burma, attacking people, peaceful protesters on the front lines, how do they live? How do they sleep? And I, I don't think they can. I don't think they can rest easily unless there's just so much delusion there, you know, that they've had to kind of turn these functions off. It's almost like you'd have to, um, numb out your sense of moral conscience and caution just to get by. So as long as these two are alive and well, it's wonderful. As long as, of course, we don't get go to extremes as in anything. And then the next one is that one learns, remembers, investigates and penetrates well by view the teachings. And that, yeah, again, memory remembers the teachings, yeah, reflecting upon them applying them, even experiencing them, right? Penetrating them well. 
And the fifth one is that one arouses energy for abandoning the unwholesome and acquiring the wholesome. Yes, I should have said at the beginning, actually, that all these seven are ways to abandon the unwholesome and develop the wholesome. So I missed that out. To abandon the blameworthy and develop the blameless and to maintain oneself in purity. So they're all aspects of the gatekeeper, right? So yeah, the next one is to arouse the energy needed to do that. So we have to be motivated enough. We have to have enough awareness, enough brightness in the mind to, to actually know how to do that and to do that. And then the next one is the mindfulness. So I'll read that one out if I can find it. So this is the seventh or the sixth, the sixth. Just as the gatekeeper in the king's frontier fortress is wise, competent and intelligent, one who keeps out strangers and admits acquaintances for protecting its inhabitants and for warding off outsiders, so too a noble disciple is mindful, possessing supreme mindfulness and alertness, one who remembers and recollects what was done and said long ago. With mindfulness as their gatekeeper, the noble disciple or anybody, any of us, any practitioner, um, abandons the unwholesome and develops the wholesome, abandons what is blameworthy and develops what is blameless and maintains oneself in purity. And then the next one is um, the wisdom that actually discerns the arising and passing away of phenomena. So they are the seven ways to develop the wholesome, abandon the unwholesome, and maintain oneself in purity, yeah. to keep a beautiful, pure, shiny, sparkling mind. And then it's very interesting because it goes on to the four jhanas from here, which is often the outcome of having purified the mind to that extent. You know, so a clean mind, a mind without hindrances is capable of perceiving very subtle experiences. And then it talks about the four jhanas being easy to attain without trouble or difficulty at this point. Just as bhikkhunis, much grass, firewood and water are stored up in the king's frontier fortress for the delight, relief and comfort of its inhabitants and for warding off outsiders, so too secluded from sense pleasures, secluded from unwholesome states. So now we're actually far away from those unwholesome states. A noble disciple or anyone who's practicing enters and dwells in the first jhana, which consists of rapture and pleasure born of seclusion for his own delight, relief and comfort and for entering upon Nibbana. And I did miss out one little phrase there because it said accompanied by thought and examination. But this is actually a really unfortunate translation because there's actually no thinking in these states. Thinking stops long, long before. Thinking is actually one of those enemies that we sometimes think is our friend. So as I said, we have to know which is which, right? And even in the Vitaka Santana Sutta, there are five different ways of uh, overcoming thought. And even when we've managed to develop wholesome thought, the Buddha still says that that wholesome thought, although it won't defile the mind, it will make us tired. It will tire the body and mind. And when the mind is body, and uh, body is tired, and the mind is tired, um, it's not stable enough to enter those peaceful states. So actually it's the silence that is our friend and the silence develops a long time before we get close to these jhanas. So that translation is for the two words vitaka and vichara and in the context of jhana practice that really means directed and sustained attention, not thought and uh, what does it say here? Thought and examination. It's more like vitaka is like ringing a gong and vichara is like the sound of the gong. So vitaka goes to its object, to the breath, and vichara stays with it, 
keeps on experiencing it for prolonged periods of time. So these two are actually subverbal, they're not verbal. So these are these beautiful states of mind. And of course, by then we have a very beautiful heart. We have a very beautiful mind for the duration of that time. And because the hindrances have been really kind of, uh, what could you say? It sounds a bit violent to say knocked out, but they have been abandoned, let's say, for that duration. So that after those states, the mind will be really bright and energized. And at that point, it has the possibility to see things as they truly are. The Buddha says again and again in the suttas, samadhi pachaya yata bhuta jnana dasana. That means from samadhi, one sees things as they truly are. And it's precisely because those hindrances are overcome that we have a chance to see through lenses that are clear, completely clear. They maybe even have like special, what do you call it, magnifying effects. So we can see closely phenomena that we'd never see with our ordinary lens. And also they, that we can sustain our awareness on something and really penetrate deeply into it to see things we've never seen before. That's also why the Buddha likens it to a mind of molten gold. He said that um, when the five hindrances are there, it's like it makes the gold brittle. There's lead, copper, tin or dust or sand in the gold. So you have to melt that gold down, take out the impurities, melt it down and then it becomes workable, pliant, malleable, and not biased to what it's going to see. So it's able to see deeper realities such as impermanence, such as non-self, without being shaken, because you've already got this deep inner resource of incredible bliss. And the Buddha describes the jhanas, the four jhanas, as um, the bliss of renunciation, <clears throat> nekama sukha the bliss of seclusion, paviveka sukha, but real seclusion, like paviveka means, viveka is like seclusion, paviveka is an intensifier. That means like full seclusion, not only from sensual pleasures, but from the sense world itself. Yeah, really secluded, deep, deep inside. And then he said it's um, upasama sukha. That means the, the bliss of peace. So you see, this is a very different kind of bliss than the bliss that excites, the bliss that stimulates the senses and makes us hungry for more. It's the bliss of peace. A peace that's so satisfied, it just, the mind doesn't want to move. And then finally, he calls it Sambodhi Sukha, the bliss of enlightenment, which can be confusing because it's not enlightenment. These are Samadhi states, but it's so powerful and those who have experienced this time and again will say, you know, that they can understand why people might feel they're enlightened at that point. Because there's this feeling of like union with something, um, union with God, if you're a Christian, <laughs> or something like pure consciousness, pure love. So some people take this as like a transcendent state. And of course, it has transcended the ordinary sensual world, but it's still not the final goal. It's, it's just in the sense a way of resourcing the mind very deeply, but it is still a stepping stone to be able to use that powerful mindfulness that's purified actually in the fourth jhana to then penetrate the truth of the way things really are. So it's at that point we can say our perception is actually reliable when we're able to see things like impermanence, suffering, and the whole field of suffering, which is even includes the field of pleasure, right? Any experience, any perception ultimately is suffering because it has to pass away and non-self. So none of this belongs to us. And these are deep teachings and I mean, slightly scary teachings. I remember, you know, practicing in India. It was actually a retreat with Goenkaji himself many years ago and I was having this experience of things just dissolving, just passing away. Like everything was just almost like sandbanks, just, you know, passing, passing, passing. And I thought, gosh, you know, all these things, the people that I love, the things that I sort of identify with in my life, none of them really are mine. And I said to him, there's this sadness, you know, that comes. And he said, that's natural. That's really natural at this stage, you know, because it is kind of a, a shock in the beginning. But after a while, it becomes an enormous relief. And this is just a small insight. This is not like a deep, liberating insight. But these kind of things come along the way. Uh, 
I mean, people talk about liberation all the time now. That's why I want to emphasize the difference between real full liberation that makes one a noble person and liberation in the sense of, ah, what a relief when we just have any insight arising in meditation. And that's how we know it's an insight that should be a freeing of the mind, a kind of lightness in the mind. Um, and a sense of sort of inner assurance that, yes, this is the right path. And I think that's what, you know, this practice has given me more than anything is just this sense that there's a path. It's such an incredible thing, you know, because every religion in a sense teaches us that we should create and develop a beautiful mind. But where are the tools, you know? Men, most, much of the time, it's more like a commandment or a should. And it's like, yeah, every alcoholic knows that the next drink won't be good for them, but how can they help themselves? This is what addiction is. So without some kind of training of the mind, training in perception, training cultivating wholesome states, you know, we might know more, we might be more moralistic and judge ourselves and judge others around us, but it might not really help us very much. So I feel that the Buddha's path is just so wonderful and we can take a lot of delight just in, you know, every single step we take because we can know one step is that one step closer to the goal. You might still have many overwhelming emotions that come up. I have them myself. You know, and what I'm doing at the moment is really hard. I mean, I'm the only fully ordained nun in the country. It's incredibly isolating to feel that not even the main sangha here accept us. You know, there are no other monastics around who I can just meet. Actually, I say that there's one monastic here today, which is very nice, but. Um, we haven't met yet. She's in Oxford and she's not so well, but she's here. I just wanted to say hello <laughs> yeah, to Venerable Damodina. She's here. But I haven't actually seen another monastic in person for more than a year. Of course, it's Corona. Uh, the Corona pandemic is still going on and I've been very careful. But, but you know, it has a lot of challenges when you're trying to... Um, in a way, somebody used this word recently, revolutionize the Sangha. I mean, it's a big word, but um, I gave an interview with my teacher, Ajahn Brahm, about bhikkhuni ordination and why it matters. And somebody said at the end, it is revolutionary what you're doing because you're going, you know, against the patriarchal systems that are so strongly in place, you know, and trying to, um, yeah, represent women and, and allow women to see that there are opportunities that maybe they're not aware of, that we can claim the inheritance that we received from the Buddha. But it takes quite a lot of confidence to walk that path. But I just encourage myself by knowing that my motivation's good. And there's actually another sutta. Um, maybe I'll just read it out before we do some meditation because it's very nice. Um, and it talks about the difference between pleasant feelings or unpleasant feelings and virtuous states of mind. Because the two aren't always the same. You can have an unpleasant feeling, but still be on the path. You can have a pleasant feeling, but still be cultivating the unwholesome. So this is from the Majjhima Nikaya number 70. And the Buddha says here, when someone feels a certain kind of pleasant feeling, non-virtuous states increase and virtuous states diminish. But when someone feels another kind of pleasant feeling, non-virtuous states diminish and virtuous states increase. So two kinds of pleasant feeling here. And I think the point is that one of those pleasant feelings is more along the lines of sense pleasure that maybe involve even breaking your precepts, yeah? like greed or um, envy. It might feel good at the time, actually envy doesn't, but greed might feel good at the time or, you know, indulging in sense pleasures might feel good at the time, but it actually causes the wholesome states to diminish. The other kind of pleasant uh, feeling causes them to increase. So they're the kind of pleasant experiences that we're developing through beautifying the mind. Then he says, when someone feels a certain kind of painful feeling, non-virtuous states increase and virtuous states diminish. But when someone feels another kind of painful feeling, non-virtuous states diminish and virtuous states increase. So we can actually be suffering and yet 
still increasing our wholesome qualities. And the example that comes to my mind is just when you feel doubt or you feel like things are really difficult, but you still carry on. You know, you have that confidence, that perseverance to just trust and take one more step, even though, you know, you're tired, even though, you know, you, you, your small sense of self might be saying, ah, I don't like this, but still, you know, it's the right thing to do. Or perhaps you exercise a bit of restraint and it's unpleasant at first because you wanted to have that extra bag of crisps or whatever. So you get an unpleasant feeling. But actually, that restraint comes in handy at a critical time in your life and prevents you from doing something really harmful to yourself or another person. Yeah. In here, in this book, it's a book by the Dalai Lama. He said another example is like taking a lower paying job to avoid having to lie to clients or customers. And having to suffer the unhappiness of, you know, maybe having less money, but you have the added virtue. And in the long run, this is going to be for your benefit. So some of these qualities, you know, they might not have instant results. You might be performing wholesome acts for a long time and not get any pleasant reward. But we're looking at long term happiness, not short term trifling worldly gains. Yeah. So that's really important. And to just trust that if your motivation is good, you will benefit in the long run. There's no other way it can go. So trust in that kindness, trust in those right motivations. And then you can really say that you're walking this path. So somebody asked for the name of the book. So it's going to be posted in the chat, but I think it's probably the Angutara Nikaya, um, which is one of the books from the Pali Canon. It's called The Numerical Discourses, and they're big, heavy books translated by Bhikkhu Bodhi. So you can find them on, you know, the usual places, like also wisdom publications, but of course also the big bad booksellers. <laughs> you know who I mean? <laughs> So it's up to you where you want to find those things. And um, yeah, if I get a chance, I'll, I'll write it in the box or maybe one of the co-hosts can spell Angutara. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so that was a slightly longer talk than I had meant to give, but I enjoyed it. I hope that <laughs> I'm not losing any of you. Um, so shall we do some meditation once again? Yeah. So this meditation will be for about, about half an hour. If you wish to take a five minute break, you can. Should we do that? Should we have a five minute break or, or is everyone good? You all look pretty good. Okay. So just adjusting your posture, however you wish. <laughs> I can see my two friends there together. That's nice. Hi, Anna and Karen. Yes. <laughs> All cosy. <laughs> so we start in a couple of minutes. So just noticing also how your awareness starts to shift in these transitions from being really engaged, perhaps staring into the screen. You know, my eyes get quite fixated and just gently, gently withdrawing, coming into yourself, but keeping the goodness of that feeling of connection to the people in this space. Having a sip of water, if you wish. And in these meditations, they're just offerings, they're just suggestions. I know that many people will have their own ways of practicing. I know that you were with Ajahn Suchito last week, who has a very embodied, energetic sort of way of working. I know that Bhante Bodhidhamma, somebody mentioned him, he has another Mahasi style method of noting. So do feel free to use any method that works for you. My main encouragement will be 
to focus on the way that you're aware, not so much what you're aware of. I'll give some suggestions, but as long as you're developing kindness, peace, gentleness in your way of looking, your way of regarding experience, you can be sure that you're walking the path. So gently closing your eyes, if that works for you. Sometimes people might feel that the experience is too intense, might want to have their eyes open slightly, especially if there's any trauma in the body or mind. Or sometimes when you feel sleepy, my suggestion is usually just to, to stay with that to treat it with kindness, but sometimes it can help to gently open the eyes. Or if you're really caught in a cycle of, you know, unwholesome thinking that's taking you down a sort of dungeon, you might want to just open your eyes and rest them on the ground ahead of you. But we can begin by gently settling into our body. And maybe taking two or three slightly deeper breaths. Relishing the ability to breathe clean air. To breathe easily, energizing the mind and then to release. Noticing the different energetic effects of the in-breath and the out-breath. Relaxing on the out-breath. Allowing your body, muscles, flesh, skin to relax. Just enjoying these slightly longer, deeper breaths. And when you're ready, allowing the breath to just return to its regular rhythm. and settling into your body. So I'd like to start by offering a suggestion, which my teacher Ajahn Brahm calls programming mindfulness. So we establish our intention very clearly with a little affirmation. It can be anything you wish, but I'd like to share the direct words of the Buddha in another sutta in the Anguttara Nikaya. My mind will be firm 
and well settled internally. My mind will be firm and well settled internally. My mind will be firm and well settled internally. And unwholesome states will not obsess my mind. Unwholesome states will not obsess my mind. Unwholesome states will not obsess my mind. So just giving this suggestion this direction to your mind and relaxing. Letting mindfulness do its job. You've established the conditions. And now we're just going to water those seeds, water the Bodhi tree in our mind. So once again, establishing mindfulness along with kindness. You could call this kindfulness or loving awareness. As though mindfulness were like the light of the sun and kindness, friendship, Benevolence were like the warmth. And bringing that to bear, to shine on your body, starting from the top of the head. So wherever your awareness spreads, that kindness follows, as though mindfulness were the medium through which your kindness can flow and reach each and every part, each and every cell of your body, whilst it also purifies your mind. Spreading that beautiful kindfulness across the whole scalp area, noticing any sensations that you experience in that place. Perhaps different sensations on different parts of your scalp area, maybe tingling, warmth, cold, throbbing, aching. Notice how that kind awareness affects your experience. if it affects your experience at all. A kind awareness that just gives things space, allows them to be, allows the nature to unfold. And you might find this awareness starts to spread naturally in its own speed. A 
across the brow, forehead. Releasing and relaxing any tension in the brow, the temples, the eyes, the eye sockets. As though your eye sockets were just floating in empty space. Your eyeballs rather. Allowing the cheeks to soften and relax. Noticing sensations on the cheeks, the lips, the jaw. Noticing the cavity in the mouth. The sensation of saliva, moisture, warmth. And bathing your neck and your shoulders in this kindfulness. Knowing your experience and caring for it. The way a mother would care and soothe a child. Caressing any aches or pains, knotted muscles, tension in the shoulder area. Allowing it to release and relax. You might wish to spend longer on any areas of tightness, maybe injuries, just infusing them with kindness and care as though the sunshine were penetrating right through the muscle, giving those muscles full permission to relax, to repair. And this kindfulness flows down your arms, into your armpits, the inner arm, the elbow, the lower arm and the hands. Notice if your hands are relaxed or holding tension. Just allow them to be, receiving any sensation in your hands, your palms, your fingers and fingertips. And caring for them. Spreading this kind awareness down your neck, your throat, chest. To the rib cage, 
the tummy, all the inner organs. Right down to your hips. Flowing down your back. Covering every area of your back. The way the sun would shine from behind. Warming up the whole back area, right down to the buttocks and the hips. Maybe noticing sensations inside the trunk. Without trying to identify various organs just experiencing the felt sense. And caring for those sensations. Allowing your body, your tummy, your back to relax. If you find your mind is becoming tight or tense, maybe getting stuck around disagreeable sensations, see if you can gently spread your awareness to include some of the area around that difficulty. Noticing how those sensations change. Exploring the sensations in your hips and hip joints, your buttocks. Your thighs. Maybe noticing the field of temperature, weight, solidity, texture, whatever arises for you. Just keeping your mind relaxed. Being kind to your body. Knowing the difference between any sensation that is unpleasant and yet can be soothed with kindness, with kindfulness, and sensations that may be caused by overstraining. If you do need to move your limb, check your motivation. If it's one of compassion, and feel free to just gently adjust, maintaining your awareness on that moving part, 
Noticing how that change affects the sensations that you feel. And this mindfulness with kindness spreads into your knees. Down your legs to the shins, the calves. The area behind the knee, which may be bent. All the way down to your ankles and your feet. See if you can notice sensations in each of your toes. Perhaps staying a little longer in any area that feels numb, not very clear, without expecting anything, just allowing mindfulness to brighten up in its own time. Now just noticing when you've covered each and every part of the body, just getting a sense of the body as a whole. Perhaps picking up any areas that still feel tight or tense. Imagining giving them a mental massage as though your kindfulness was swirling around them, bathing them in kindness and warmth. Or imagining, if you like, that your body's floating in a warm bathtub or lagoon, fully supported by the water. So no holding, no tension is needed at all. So all tension were just seeping out of every pore in your skin. And you're just floating in this warm pool of water, totally at ease. Nothing to attain, nowhere to go, no need for thought or thinking. Noticing the silence between your thoughts, the silence between 
between my words. beauty the simplicity of a gentle and quiet mind Just resting in this silent mind. And as your mind quietens, simplifies, you might notice the breathing. If the breathing comes into your mind, just welcome her. without grasping, just staying receptive, open, and present with each simple, humble breath. Allowing the mind to rest on the breath, to trust the breath. To carry your mind to stillness, to peace. Knowing you can always Come back just to this beautiful attitude of kindness, gentleness. No matter what arises, if the breath wants to stay, you let it stay. If it leaves, let it leave. You just keep on cultivating a beautiful attitude in your mind. And all these beautiful, subtle objects of meditation will be attracted to come and visit in their own time.
arriving with each breath, delighting in each breath, as though this breath, this moment, the only moment in the world, Treating this moment the way you treat the most precious of friends. Regarding this moment with kindly eyes. So we're coming close to the end of this meditation. But you can carry on if you wish. So for those who wish to sit longer, you can choose to let these words just wash over you. For those who wish, staying connected to any peace, any joy, any beauty in the mind. You can very gently start to change your posture. And without breaking the continuity of practice, just move into a period of walking meditation once again. So give yourself time to emerge. And we're going to do some walking for about 20 minutes or so. And then have another silent meditation after that. We will have a tea break after the silent meditation. Uh, so if you're thirsty now, I suggest just having a glass of water and trying to maintain some of the continuity. So there will be time for tea and questions later on, but this is like the heart of the day now. So it's really nice if we can continue to build that momentum, that cultivation of wholesome states. So you might wish to do some walking in your home or maybe outdoors, see what works for you.
And please don't push yourself with any of these instructions. If you really feel too tired and you just want to curl up in a in a ball, <laughs> that's also okay. Yeah, that's really okay. So just see how you can best nourish yourself. So I'll see you back here at about 20 past three.